concerned this past week when the news broke that Chief Justice John Roberts was uh, having to uh, pay for uh, his uh, Starbucks coffee with cash. It seems that somebody had hacked his credit card. Now, we thought that was funny that a man of such great power was finally being kind of, well, normal like us. Then it kind of bothered us that, wow, if they will steal the credit card number of the Chief Justice of the United States, the rest of us are pretty much toast, aren't we? They're not afraid of anybody. So, so we have all of these proofs. We have security systems uh, on our credit cards and passwords and firewalls on our computers so that nobody can get to our stuff. We have child-proofed our homes. Although when Chris and Craig were little, Jeannie and I threatened to rent them out as child-proof testers. <laughs> because whatever we brought home claiming to be child-proof, we found out in a matter of minutes really wasn't. And some of you have come to this worship service thinking your life is Jesus proof. You have put up enough walls, enough barriers, enough limits, enough safeguards that Jesus either can't get to you or if he does, he can only get so far. So Paul, who is then Saul, is on Damascus Road and he thinks his life is Jesus proof. And then he met Jesus. So Luke records in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 1. Stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this passage together. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, that if, anyone, that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, either men or women, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he traveled and he was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He asked. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. And then Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could not see anything. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days, nor did he eat or drink anything. Now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, he said, get up and go to the street called Straight, the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. And in a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias coming in, placing his hands on him that he may regain his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard from many people about this man and how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And now he's come with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go for this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and sons of Israel. I will certainly show him how much he must suffer for my name. And so Ananias left and entered the house. And he placed his hands on Saul and he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road that you were traveling and sent me to you that you may gain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at once, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. As you came to Saul, come to us, that we may be more, more close to who you are, know better who we are, and the purpose to which we have been called. And we pray this in your name. Amen. 
Today we start our series of sermon on the life of Paul, the ministry of Paul as recorded in the book of Acts called The Vision. The reason we call it The Vision is in the end of the book when Paul is brought up before the religious leaders and the kings and the governors of the area under the Roman authority, he is given a chance to defend his life, to answer the charges that are being brought against him. And instead of responding in a legal response asserting his innocence and defending his rights, Paul gives a testimony. He preaches a sermon. He even goes so far as offering an invitation. And King Agrippa famously responds, in so short a time, do you think that I am going to become a Christian? Or as the King James translates it, I am almost persuaded. Paul tells Agrippa that I have not been disobedient to this vision. And the vision he's talking about is the encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus road. Everything in Paul's life comes from this moment and goes back to this moment. Whenever he is challenged, whenever a, a group of other people say, we don't think you're a real apostle, he always comes back to this moment as proof that he has indeed been called and has the rights and the authority of an apostle. And, and so to the Corinthians, he will give a lengthy defense of the resurrection. And he will talk about all the people that Christ appeared to. And then he will add this sentence, and to one untimely born, he appeared to me. When the Galatians church said, we don't think you're a real apostle, he answers, let no one challenge my credentials again. For I have seen the Lord. Over and over again, whenever Paul is pushed, this is the moment that he comes back to, this encounter with the risen Christ. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that of all the places on the map, that Jesus appears to, to Saul on the road to Damascus. You would think it'd be somewhere around Jerusalem. After all, Saul had been in Jerusalem. He'd been in Jerusalem for a long time. In fact, we have record that he was there when Stephen, the first, one of the first deacons, was executed. When he was stoned to death, we're told that Saul, a young man Saul, held the coats of the people who stoned Stephen. He was there when Stephen prayed for the forgiveness of those who were now killing him. So it is not impossible that that was still in Saul's mind, that the encounter he had had with the other followers of the way, which is what the Christians were called then, was beginning to work in his life. He couldn't quite get it out of his head, the way they responded and the way that they endured the punishment that he inflicted on them. And the harder he fought, it seemed, the deeper he got. So now he is on the road to Damascus. Now Saul knew all about the stories, about how Christ had been crucified, that was common knowledge. About how Christ was dead, that was common knowledge. About how he'd been laid in a tomb, common knowledge. Everybody knew that, everybody in the tomb where he was buried. But now his followers said that Christ was no longer in that tomb, but was alive. And it appeared to some of his followers, so, so real was their testimony, so powerful was their belief that not even torture, suffering could change their mind. In fact, this thing called the way was about to get out of hand. It had already turned Jerusalem upside down, and now it was spreading to nearby cities like Damascus. So Saul said, if I'm going to get hold of this thing, if I'm going to stomp this thing out, I need to get to Damascus. He was given papers by the chief priest to identify himself to the synagogues there in Damascus, to give him some kind of authority. And so he could say, hey, I have the power to act. Rome didn't care. To them, it was just a little religious um, inter-squad game. And as long as it didn't threaten the Roman government or have anything to do with their rule or their taxes, they didn't care. Handle it. And so Saul went to Damascus to find more followers of the way. But there's something about a resurrected Jesus that's kind of dangerous, isn't he? I tell you this all the time. One of the interesting things about God is our God won't stay where we put him. And a lot of us have had experiences with God that we think are so real, so deep, so rich that we, that we put it in a place in our life and we say, that is where I will meet God as if God will stay there. Some of us have had religious experience and we said, well, that's enough God for me. Thank you very much. And we build a little box in our heart and we say, that's where God will stay. But he won't affect this other part of my life. He won't be involved in these decisions of my life because I have God in a box over here. 
We have tried to put Jesus in tombs of all kinds for thousands of years. He won't stay where you put him. He didn't stay in the tomb in Jerusalem. He won't stay wherever you and I put him either. And there's something that is very unnerving to us, isn't there? To hear the news that Jesus is on the loose. We thought he was over there. No, he's not over there. Where is he? We don't know. And we've got all kinds of stories where he just appears to people when they thought they were safe. The early church meets, locks the doors and locks the windows so that nobody can know they're there. The Roman soldiers won't be able to find them. They have found a safe place. Guess what? Jesus walks in anyway. And you know, ever since then, churches have been trying to lock doors to keep Jesus out. He finds his way anyway. There's something very unnerving, isn't there, about this Jesus who's on the loose. Saul was very well trained. He knew the scriptures, knew it in and out, backward and forward. And he's going to Damascus. And there Jesus meets him. Paul is overwhelmed. He collapses to the ground. He loses his sight. He doesn't know what's going on. He can't figure it out. He's totally disoriented. Not only can he not see, Jesus wants him to understand, Saul, you've been buying the whole time. I'm just letting you experience what you have been dealing with the whole time. You've been buying the whole time, kid. And now Saul begins to talk with him. Who are you? Lord, isn't that interesting? Not sir. Not who are you? Who are you boss? Because anybody that's not me to the ground like this, anybody that's already taken my sight is the boss. And I need to know who you are. And he says, I'm Jesus that you persecute. Interesting little bit of ecclesiology, church theology, isn't it? That to persecute the church, to attack the church is to attack the body of Christ. I am Jesus that you're persecuting. Now go into Damascus and I'll tell you what to do next. That's a frustrating thing about Jesus, isn't it? He won't tell you the second thing until you do the first thing. Some of you are frustrated right now because God won't tell you step four and five. And he's saying, do step one, I'll tell you step two. Go to the city and wait. And I'll tell you. And then he goes to a man named Damas- uh, Ananias, who's in Damascus, a, a Christ follower. Obviously a man of a deep commitment to Christ because Jesus is trusting him with this message, with this message to Saul, who is now going to become Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And I love that this is a funniest story in Get this, Ananias, yes, Lord. Now, you, you would think a vision from Jesus would be enough, right? How many of us have said, if I could just see Jesus, I would never doubt it, right? Well, it must not work because Ananias argues. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> Lord, I've heard a lot about this guy. Do you know who he is? As if Jesus is going to say, ah, wrong guy, Ananias, I'll get back to you. (laughs) Do you know who he is? Ananias doesn't believe that Paul has been converted. He doesn't believe that Saul is now Paul. He doesn't believe that Jesus could change a life like that. And and listen, you and I wouldn't have believed it either. Okay? Nobody believed it. They didn't believe it in Damascus. So much so that there were some people there trying to kill him, get rid of him, and he had to escape through a hole in the wall and run off. When he got to Jerusalem, they didn't believe him there either. He was hiding in Tarsus when Barnabas finds him later and brings him to Antioch to start preaching and teaching. Nobody believed that he was converted. We don't believe either. Somebody gets arrested. You know how it goes, right? Somebody gets arrested. Somebody's in deep trouble, right? What's the first thing they do? Oh, they find Jesus. Right? And they'll come to the press conference going, I've been forgiven by Jesus. Implication, we should let them out of jail. Right? And forgive them all that they did because Jesus has forgiven them. And we're watching this press conference and we're going, right. 
Right, it's just the next part of the con, right? So much so that when we hear people talk about being changed by Jesus, we just, we're, just, we're just not sure. Sometimes the last people to believe are those who talk about it the most, are those who proclaim that Jesus has the power to change the life of the most lost person you have ever met. In one of my early churches, there was a young man named Alex. Alex was, had, had trouble with most things. <laughs> And, and as you, he was one of those people taking the long way home, you know what I mean? He was, never, he was never criminal in his behavior, but he always knew where the line was. And he didn't cross it, but he leaned over it all the time. And everybody was always worried about Alex. He was trouble in his home. He was trouble at school. Everybody knew Alex. And Alex and I got to hanging around and talking a little bit. And all of a sudden, Alex makes a profession of faith. And Alex changed. And people will pull me over in that little town going, what did you do to Alex? I didn't do anything to Alex. No, really, I knew Alex. What, what, is, what is going on with Alex? I said, well, if you want to know, Alex got saved. You mean like Jesus in your heart saved? Yeah, like Jesus in your heart saved. Nah! What did you, and all these were Christians. Why is it the last thing we believe is that Jesus will actually change somebody's life? that he has the power to do that. Well, one of the reasons is, just between you and me, is we have him let him change our own lives very much. So we're not sure he can really change anybody else's life. Isn't it funny that the world knows how dangerous the name of Jesus is more than we do? People call me. We're having a get-together, Reverend Glenn. We would like for you to do the invocation. Okay. You do know I'm a Christian pastor. You do know I will pray in the name of Jesus. You know that. Uh, Reverend Glenn, let us get back to you. I don't get asked to do that very much anymore. Why is it that that's the name you can't speak? Because the world knows the very mention of of the name brings a power you can't control. What happens when Jesus gets loose? That frightens us, doesn't it? And so we start building walls. And there's all kinds of ways you can build a wall. Some of us build religious walls. Some of us think that if we stay busy in church that we don't have to talk to Jesus much. And we don't mind going to church, we don't mind sitting in the pew, we don't mind singing the songs, we don't mind studying the Bible as long as the conversation is always about Jesus and never with him. Some of us know a lot about Jesus, but we don't know Jesus. As if we're studying for some celestial game of jeopardy. Bible for 500, Alex. And we'll answer that question but we will have never met him. Some of us have piled up another thing uh, uh, on the other side. We try to pile up all of the bad things we know. Uh, We try to do things as badly as we know how to do them, wreck our lives as thoroughly as we can so that Jesus will at long last give up on us. You are now officially unlovable. And we think we can go so far into the dark that not even the light of God can find us. We think we're the great exception. That the gospel may be good news for everybody else, but, but not for me. Mike, you wouldn't be so sure if you knew my story. Mike, you wouldn't be so confident of Jesus' power if you knew what I've done and the people I've hurt and the places I've been. I, I wasn't called to find out all the things you have done wrong. I don't need to know the details of all your mistakes. That's not why I'm here. I'm here so that you know that nothing you have ever done in your life can cancel out what Jesus did for you on the cross. Nothing that you have ever done in your life 
is bigger than what Jesus did on the cross. Now, that would be good news if that's where it stopped. If that's where the gospel stopped, that Jesus died for you and you are free from the guilt of your sins. That would be news enough. But that's not where the gospel starts, stops. That's where it indeed starts. That forgiveness is the place where Jesus releases you for a new life. That the resurrection means the life that came to Christ in that tomb now in the power of his spirit comes to you and me. You're free from your sins, free from the curse of death, free from the, from the slavery of your mistakes. Now you are invited, given the ability to live freely, freely in the name of Jesus Christ. If any person be in me, in Christ, behold, the old has passed away. I'm making everything new. All your mistakes, all your failures, don't counsel out what Jesus did for you on the cross. All your failures, all your mistakes, all the work, all the things do not equal what Jesus wants to offer you now in his resurrected life. The good news of the gospel is not that you can find God. I'm not here to offer you 10 easy steps to get to God or here are the four things you have to do to make yourself lovable. I'm here to tell you that God and Jesus Christ has come to you. And nothing, not even death itself, will keep him from you. Not the world, not death, not all your mistakes, not all your failures, nothing will keep Jesus from you. You can build the wall as high as you want to. You can dig it down and make it as deep as you want to. But we've tried to put Jesus in little boxes and little caves for thousands of years and he won't stay where we put him. He keeps coming, keeps seeking, and there's something very dangerous and very glorious about a Jesus who's on the loose, who won't let anything keep him from finding you the way he found Saul. And I know, you think you're safe. You think you got your life all Jesus proof. Saul did too. And then he met Jesus.